I don't believe in free speech. I don't believe in free speech. I can't stand what they teach. I don't believe in free speech. I can't stand what they teach. I can't stand what they preach. I don't believe in free speech. All this gender identity talk it made me think of old Emil Rattlebond. Remember that guy? Oh, yeah. He made that whole stand about wanting to change his age because he thought it would help him out like on his Tinder profile if he was younger. <laughs> Could score with the ladies a little better. And everybody immediately was saying like, you know, well, is this a stunt to prove a point or is he serious? And he, you know, he he like held the bluff. If it was a bluff, he held it all the way through as far as I know and just kept saying, no, I my doctor tells me I'm 10 years younger then it says on my birth certificate, my, my doctor says I have the health of a man who's 10 years younger. I feel 10 years younger, so I should be able to legally declare myself 10 years younger. If people can change their gender because of what they feel like, why can't I change my age? And, of course, I'm sitting there going, here we go. You know, and, and of course, and what happened is the judge threw it out of court um, because – uh, the ruling was something like essentially, what was it? Unlike age, gender does not carry specific rights and responsibilities. Is that what it was? And I'm like, um, uh, let me show you my uh, selective service draft card and you tell me if gender does or does not carry specific, uh, <laughs> right? And so they, I mean, they threw him out of court um, for that. But then like the draft thing, that's a thing now too, of course. Um, so good job, ladies. Um, now we can all get drafted. Like at this point, you can get your gender legally changed. And I've been saying all along, well, hang on. If this 22-year-old um, uh, bio, like biologically female person has, has declared themselves legally to be male, why are they not immediately required to, select to, to register for selective service? Because that's what, that's what I had to do to go to college, to get loans, to do almost anything. Right. And you can't and you can't as a biological male, you cannot get out of registering for the draft if you declare yeah. yourself to be a woman. Because yeah, men have been trying that. I mean, like we're like Corporal Klinger from MASH, you know, he's like he's with the whole time cross dressing for 11 years trying to get a section eight out of there. And they're like, I don't think so, Klinger. The point is all men, you know, and all of a sudden everybody knows the definition of men. You know, if you're born male, if you're assigned male at birth, then. You can be involuntarily taken from your home and forced to kill people and, and be killed, which is what that's the history of men always has been. Men know what it means to live with that. And somebody can say, oh, well, your generation, you guys never had to deal with that. But that's not true either. I mean, first of all, the generation right before me, you know, our fathers had to deal with this. They had to, you know, they either fought in Vietnam or they were or they were scared to death that they were going to get drafted and didn't get drafted. You right, know? Not to mention then, everyone who went to the Middle East. So, well, I was just going to say yeah. that was a big thing that we got into that when I was like 16 years old. I mean, I remember my father going like because he was a big hippie from Vietnam, you know, like and when that started out, he's like, they're not taking you. No, like it's not fucking happening. We're, we're moving to New Zealand or something. But it was like kind of scary. There was definitely a thought in my mind like, what the hell is this? Is this going to turn into another Vietnam? Am I going to be for did any women worry about that? Well, and and again, it, right, right now they've made the distinction between if you identify as a man versus if you are assigned male on your birth certificate, because that now there are plenty of people that we're acknowledging who were assigned female on their birth certificate, but who live and identify as men, right? Those are the trans men. They do not have to register for the draft. So now it really is about your biological sex category that you were born into or that you were assigned to at birth. It is on the table for them to change that and for everybody, include like women, men, whatever. Women still how it's been for a long time is a big double standard where women have the option and the freedom to be in the military if they want but there's no danger of being forced to be in the military like it is for every single person who is born and assigned male at birth, something their entire life they've that's been in the back of your mind. Like, well, if some shit goes down and breaks out, like they can force me to go or put me in jail if I don't want to go. And that's yeah. something women have never. So it's the same thing like when women talk about like, you know, like that's what isn't that what J.K. Rowling did? That, that was one of the things she said that got her that got her canceled. Right. Was she said. They don't colonize the experience of being female. I don't sure. Did, did she say that or is that just? I don't know if J.K. Rowling said that, but certainly a lot of critics of have said that. And then they 
then called TERFs, um, trans exclusionary radical feminists, just because they wanted to call attention to what could be like a cultural appropriation among trans women that cis women feel when they watch trans women um, doing things that sometimes feel like they're stereotyping or where they they can enjoy certain aspects of femininity and without actually paying the real costs of having been women in terms of discrimination or certain fears of violence and so forth. It's like a fun little, you know, vacation as the opposite gender in a sense. There was a, um, there was a performance done at my university um, for the performing arts series and it was a series of dancers and they were all, um, men and um, identified as men, I'm quite sure, in their day-to-day lives. But for the performance on stage, they were all dressed as um, women ballerinas and they had their, you know, their hair up in the little bun and they had the little tutus and the toe shoes on and the tights and everything. And then they did the kind of dance that typically, you know, much tinier female ballerinas do And part of it was for humor, right? Because when you see these sort of larger figures doing those kinds of dances, um, it's unusual. But it was really interesting to me because I kept looking around for like who somebody's going to be offended, not because they're anti-trans or because they're they're just very rigid in their gender. But I kept thinking, well, is is this in any way like a gender equivalent of blackface where the, the men were right. just dressed up like women for the sake of this performance. And it, it did feel a little weird as a, as a woman watching it. I mean, I was like, uh, and what's the point? Were they showing that it, that they're actually better at ballet dancing in these, um, than women? Cause they weren't probably because the moves are designed for smaller bodies I don't know you know I mean I think they got a standing ovation as though it took some great deal of courage right so and they they even had a little caveat of how they don't mean any harm by doing this so they've obviously gotten pushback for it because they or at least they're just we, we've all I mean we all know now to think that's going to be our first thought anytime we do anything we're going to like just I uh, we like I just want to make sure that this isn't going to offend one of the groups that matters um, here you know yeah. in an experience like that this is really interesting because that's like in when you're having an experience like that there are so many levels of interpretive possibility <laughs> yeah. like you could how should we take this is this do we see this as the gender blackface here where you have men co-opting the experience of women? Or are these men heroically, I mean, since I got a standing ovation, I guess it was interpreted. People decided to interpret it that way as like, oh, these men are heroically like uh, embracing femininity and casting aside their toxic masculinity or whatever they're doing. Um, or is it is it what? You know, because so when when you deal with just the experience – of trans men in general it is colonizing the experience of being male it's absolutely fine with me not that that matters but like do whatever you want wear bag wear your ugly baggy jeans and cut your hair short and you know take testosterone and 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 work on your biceps that's fine if you feel better about yourself doing that that's great I mean, I might ask, why not dress like Niles Crane or something from Frasier? Like, <laughs> that's how you would dress. <laughs> Do you, yeah, like dress like yeah. I mean, how about in, like why not? Okay, we're gonna dress like men, like Bing Crosby. You know, like dress like Frank Sinatra. Dress like men used to dress. <laughs> Well, as you say, it reminds me of a a male friend of mine a long time ago who said how, you know, if he were a woman, he would just be natural like that. would You know, why don't women just, you know, go go a sort of natural look It's so much more comfortable and more attractive. And I said, well, of course, you think that because you're a man. And so you can't imagine doing all that. Right. So if if you were a woman, you imagine being just like you are now. I, as a socially constructed man, am never going to be able to see it the same way as you, a socially constructed woman. That's why it. That's why you can look in your community calendar right now, wherever you are, and you will see woman-only groups. 
you know, here's a group for women, about women, where we sit around and we discuss the experience of being a woman. And it's that sort of neo-spiritual woman, like woman power sisterhood thing, right? Where there's something undefinable that that is that there is to being a woman like being a woman comes with a power you have a power because you are a woman and those have always been around they've always kind of pissed me off because it's because sisterhood is sacred brotherhood is toxic you you yeah. just cannot you you know you can't have it both ways people you can't have one and not the other just a little more than a year ago um at my university, a, a couple of women decided that the fa- governing body of the faculty should have a women-only wing to it. And I, being a woman, or at least what they assumed was a woman, got the invitation to attend this sort of after-hours event for just the women who were part of the elected representative body of the faculty. And I completely opposed, but everyone else is like, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> oh, my God. They're the same people who would crucify, who would crucify. If you suddenly, if if you put a flyer out like, you know, men only, you, you know, unite for this evening to celebrate our power, there would be, there would be signs everywhere going like, you know, they would be creating safe spaces everywhere for people suddenly. Their argument would be, but men shouldn't do that because they don't need that because they actually are the privileged majority, maybe even a tyrannical majority. Um, But there, you know, that's really changed a lot in higher ed. And there's some colleges at a university that are, are women dominated, not um, dominated by men professors. And so, and certainly the college student population is now, you know, it's completely official. It's, uh, it's dominated by women. There are far more women entering college now than men. So it isn't just simply, uh, you know, tyrannical, patriarchal, uh, domineering situation anymore. So, um, and the men who are there are afraid to speak anyway because they, they know their place. Well, it, what's interesting is that the women are justified the women-only group on the grounds that the representative body of the faculty was being dominated by men who spoke more and took longer turns. Now, being a social scientist, I immediately wanted data that showed me that because I didn't believe it. I was like, wait a second. Uh I, I would literally, I mean, you could record, the, and we have recordings of those meetings, so you could take the recordings and actually count who took more turns and whose turns were longer. I wasn't convinced that men were talking disproportionately more often or for longer turns. So maybe I doubted it because I knew how often I spoke. <laughs> I thought, well, geez, I, there's, you know, uh, there's no way that's true for me. I'm not silenced at all in that body. Even if it were true, and this was a women, uh, you know, a male dominated thing, so women get to have a support group under the guise that, as you put it, um, you know, men don't need that because they're because they have the majority here. Well, that's just. I mean, that's such a, a stereotype by gender. Like, these are human beings. They're not numbers and they're not animals, you know? It's people, do you think, li- and this is people just lose sight of this. Like, life is still a bitch for men too, ladies. Sorry. But, you know, it is. Life is hard. It's scary. People die. You are going to die one day. It's lonely. It's awful. It's painful. Men actually do experience a lot of suffering just because like politically you are privileged i'm privileged by the fact that i'm male and i'm white and i'm tall you know (laughs) so i'm privileged but life is still very difficult just because you have political privilege do not get confused and think that that means that you have no problems it's like it's like we all have those friends who like the circles that i'm from i've never had any money nobody i know has any money and there is believe me down at the pub you hear a lot of drunken bitterness about people believing that if they had money, then everything would work in their life. And of course, that's not true. And because money is just is, is one form of privilege, right? And people, people that don't have any money 
always believe that the people that do have money have no problems. And you see somebody go by, you know, in a Mercedes or whatever, and you think it must be nice. And you just imagine that that guy has no problems. And just whatever your personal lens is, if you can't ever make it work in a relationship, you look at somebody who's married and has kids and seems to be happy. And you think, gosh, they just have no problems. And of course, you don't understand that they go home after their happy day or they look all happy walking down the promenade with their kids dressed up like Mary Poppins or something. And they go home and they go, I'm just going to go um, freshen up for a second, honey. And then they go in the bathroom and start sobbing, you know, for no, for a reason they don't even understand. Or the men are like punching fucking walls in the garage while they're out there supposed to be like, uh, you know, fixing the lawnmower. Because life is scary and terrifying and difficult, even if you are the political majority, if you're privileged. And I just am so tired of of that. Just It's so insulting, you know. Like I have my entire life has been just... Uh, is overshadowed always by this crippling anxiety disorder. And I am a white, tall, cis, straight male, you know, who who has no problems except that actually I can't even get out of bed half the days, you know? Does anybody, does, does that get to count? Because believe me, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not a privilege. So tell the story of the time that when you were a grad student and that you went and asked the professor a question. Um, I I don't know that it was a woman professor and she didn't you had a really valid question about I don't know why you got the grade you did or something. And and she did instead she just flipped it around and turned it into this whole tirade as though you were some privileged white male who. I don't know what. What was that? So this was in grad school. It was like a film theory class. And this woman was like, I mean, she was just like this, you know, kind of very pretentious European sort of artsy prof who kind of just like strutted into class like, you know, like a... (laughs) Like she was was showing up to her own art exhibit, you know. Um, But... The entire semester, we handed in multiple papers, of course, like you do in a grad seminar, and she never gave me one written scrap of feedback. She never gave me a grade. She never gave me any feedback. She never gave me anything, and we never had a conference or anything, and at the end of the semester, you know, she gave me like a B, which in grad school is bad, yeah. right? Pretty bad. That's like a re- that's like actually a real, it's a real fuck you grade, yeah. And so anyway, I emailed her. Um, this was the fall semester, so it was like almost Christmas. I emailed her, just, you know, hi, just, you know, just want to check in. This grade's a little lower than I thought. Just wanted to check in about it. Um, and she never wrote me back. So I waited a month until after the break. And then I wrote her back again. No response. I wrote her back again, like 10 days later. No response. Okay, I'm a graduate student. And this woman, I'm just asking a perfectly reasonable question. And she's completely ghosting me, right? And then finally, I just happened to run into her in front of the library and she gives me this look like, okay, well, uh, I guess let's let's go ahead and just do this. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, um, well, <laughs> listen, it's not, it doesn't have to be a, a big deal. I was just, I just, the grade was a little lower than I thought. And I just wanted to just sort of, I never got any written, any feedback about my work. I just would like to get my papers back um, and just see, you know. And she, she basically just cut me off immediately and said, you're a very charming young man and uh, and and very self-assured, but your charm is not going to work on me. So if you want to contest the grade, just contest it. And then she walks away. Okay, so let me give the gender equivalent. I'm teaching, and a <laughs> 25-year-old girl uh, comes up, you know, I refuse to give her any of her work. I give her a bad grade. She tries to get in touch with me multiple times, being polite and civil and asking only for what her due is as a graduate student. And I keep ghosting her. And then she runs into me and she was like, oh, hi, uh, uh, Mr. Monroe, could you? I was just wondering. And I go, look, listen, uh, little girl, um, you're you're very you're you're a very attractive girl. You've got a hot mouth and everything, but it's not going to work on me. Okay, you're obviously trying to sleep with me and get a good grade. It's not going to work. If you want to contest it, go ahead. But. Your charm and is not going to work on me. So, you know, I mean, that would be holy shit. I mean, I would yeah. be. Yeah, she'd be she, trying and, to get and, you and fired. And I'm sure she would have <laughs> succeeded. And and instead, what I did is I never contested the grade. I never mentioned it to anybody because I remember specifically thinking, like, well, this is bullshit. I mean, obviously, it made me very angry. But I thought I don't. I decided to not contest it ultimately because I. I remember thinking to myself, I didn't want to open that can of worms. I didn't want to be a of the world of of 
of resentful students who sue their professors. And this was a long time. This was 20 years ago, right? It wasn't like it is now where the students basically just, where the professors are just the students' bitches, you know? I mean, they just control them. And, and not, not always, I know. But I mean, it's a whole different climate, right? I mean, yeah. professors really do have to worry about that. But I didn't want to be part of that. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to make a stink in this very tiny department. So I just let it slide. But back then, what what she could do, and it's really tempting for people to do this, is use their status, in this case, the fact that that professor was a woman, to sort of say, and that you were a man, to then use that to define what's going on in the situation. So she can deflect any potential criticism that she's just not doing her job as a professor, but she immediately goes to gender to explain the dynamic going on. And then that can be the master narrative. And you don't have a chance because you're a guy. One, you're not, you, you were, didn't grow up spoiled or rich or any of those things, but she can assume that and position you that way. And that's a very frustrating. And that's, it, it's really a sort of cheap shot on her part, but people do that all the time, right? They, I mean, we talked about that last time with the Chappelle show, like, you know, if, if the trans community is mad at Chappelle, if he wants, he can frame it as that there are a bunch of privileged white people mad at him because he's a black comedian. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably not how they would explain it, right? They're thinking that they don't, they're offended by his jokes about trans people because he's not trans and he has the non trans or cisgender privilege and they have the oppressed status of being trans. And this, you know, and it, Chappelle tries to argue it's more complicated than that. And, you know, we right. talked about that. Are you punching sideways podcast, or down but, or up or which is it, but, you know, depending on how you identify. Right. But I mean, it, the, the, the first punch to throw, apparently, if you're on the defensive, is to try to pretend like you're punching up in defense of yourself, someone punching down at you when like, you were a lowly student and she was a institutionally empowered professor. So there's there's a power dynamic, which is why, uh, you know, professors would are accused of exploiting and harassing their students if they hit on them and so forth because they have institutional power. It isn't just only male professors who aren't allowed to date their female students. No professor is allowed to date a student they're supervising or grading, regardless of gender and so, or age. So even though those other factors might matter for power dynamics as well, we consider just the professor-student dynamic a power dynamic. So then, but she didn't, she didn't want to think about that dynamic, right? But you're thinking of it in those terms. And so it's, is really frustrating because I think there is a temptation to sort of fall back on um, some way you can act like you're punching up in defense of yourself because someone's exactly. punching down at yeah. you. It's just it's way too it's too it's a cheap shot because it things are more complicated than that. And it's more yeah it's more than a cheap shot. It's just deeply insulting. I mean it's exactly uh, she ought to be able to understand why it's deeply insulting. Any woman should because it is literally exactly the same thing as all along like you know the smart woman who's capable and talented and has something to say but none of the men will listen to her because she's just a girl. And they're going like yeah yeah, honey, why don't you stick to the coffee? Like, you know, like if she's saying something that seems to make sense, I must just be be bedazzled by her ass. And that's why I think it's logic, but it's actually just, no, no, no. It's just go get the cruelers, honey. You know, I mean, she's just like, that's what men have always said to women is like, if, if a woman who is just asking for what is fair and you accuse her of trying to use her gender to seduce people into giving her something that she doesn't deserve. That's what this woman was accusing me of. I was trying to use my yeah. charm and sexuality to just charm her into giving me something that I hadn't earned. When in fact, I had earned much more than she yeah. had given me. What I was asking for is my due. She's the one that she is the one screwing me over. She is the one in a position of power over me and screwing me over. And yet still she goes to the gender well to victimize herself, basically. It's a way of explaining, um, a way of explaining basically anything. It's a first line of defense. And it reminds me of, you know, like, like being accused of mansplaining, right? Like, (laughs) like, oh oh my God, like, yeah, exactly. And so like in a relationship, I mean, I'm sure there are 
like any man listening to this podcast right now probably is like, yes, I, just because I'm speaking and I'm a man doesn't mean that I'm mansplaining. Like it's very possible that the man in the scenario knows more. Or has a valid opinion. It might, it might not even be someone knows more versus less, but it has a valid point of view. Somebody, <laughs> real quick, somebody said this uh, the other day where it was like some, uh, I can't remember where I even ran across this, but again, it was a student accusing a professor of mansplaining. <laughs> I'm a man and I'm a professor. That's my job. <laughs> the history, yeah, the history scholar is teaching you about history because he's been teaching it for 50 years and he's mansplaining because he's a man. Okay, first of all, who's being a gender essentialist at this point? Which is it, people? What do you want? Right. Do you want, do you want it to not be about gender or do you want everything to be determined? Do you want a gender determinist thing where if you're born with a dick, then you're a man? Shut up and don't explain things to me. Or what? Well, what people do is... They they use it to their advantage, like you're saying. You can, you can then frame anyone you don't agree with or who you want to shut up as mansplaining. And that's really a low blow because obviously – there are people out there of all genders who are bright and have something really interesting to contribute and have valid questions and criticisms. Of, I'm thinking of the workplace more than in intimate relationships. But I have colleagues who mention or who describe um, male men colleagues as mansplaining when they don't like the point of view being raised. And, and it seems to be based on whether or not the person who charges you with mansplaining agrees with the validity of your point and they get to be the ultimate arbiter through the use of that word so if you're mansplaining you're saying something they don't want to hear um so but do they not realize they do that all the time I mean, what's that victim explaining yeah. or suffer when they, want, when they want to talk to someone who's an oppressor but they're talking as um the, the identity position whether that's a a gender position or a race position or as they are the ones who are the sufferer. So they're going to explain um, the reality to or their point of view to the other person. And then then what what are they doing? They're they're trying to school the members of the oppressor group. That's called that's called suffer explaining. But we don't have that word really. The the members of the oppress oppressing group don't get to go. Oh, now they're suffer explaining me, or they're victim explaining me. No, and that and that's of course that's the part that's so maddening to people is being instead of saying like, oh, I disagree. Here's my argument. It is you are uneducated. You need to be educated. Here are the facts. To say that it's an opinion would diminish. Your opinion. You know, every, anyone who doesn't agree with you is, by definition, in need of education. It, it's a. It's one of the uh, seductions of identity politics is that if if you have a particular identity, you get to be right. When else does that happen? Right. So you you can be the one who, on the basis of belonging to a particular identity group, gets to be right, and everybody is supposed to listen to you. And when you talk, it's not mansplaining or womansplaining or transplaining or any of those things. It's it's uh, you're just uh, educating them. Right. And then you can complain about how exhausting it is to have to educate everyone. People do disagree. And of course, people there's intergroup disagreement and intragroup disagreement. And it's way too simplistic, although seductive, to act like you can speak for an entire group or you can set everyone straight on an issue. And I mean, I think it's really hard because, of course, we know that um, historically women and trans people and people of color and poor people and people with mental illnesses have had it hard, right? That people have questioned them at every turn and they haven't been in the textbooks. And there, there's all kinds of ways in which their perspective was marginalized or deemed crazy and et cetera. So you have that history, which is really important, but uh, but we're in the 21st century. There's a, there's a lot more recognition of uh, human rights and diversity and all of that. So how do we how do we avoid an overcorrection? We're sort of crossing over the line where you know if you and I disagreed, I can't automatically be right because I'm a woman and you're a man. I mean that's ridiculous. So how do you know even even if the issue we're disagreeing about is over gender uh, in some way, right? I mean, that 
there's got to be a way in which people can engage in a good faith dialogue or discussion. I mean, what if I had gone to the women only um, group of faculty members and, you know, and then we in our in our little group decided that the, the men were all silencing us and blah, blah, blah. You know, we could we could sit and confirm each other's biases over, you know, Chardonnay and our yoga pants for, you know, three hours. But that's not. That that's not going to be necessarily objective or fair, right? because we don't necessarily know. We're just going to tell ourselves that they're silencing us. We cannot continue with this um, this moral authority totem pole where it's like, okay, here's who counts and here's who doesn't count. And of course, the whole the whole system that they are fighting is based on a different kind of uh, a different kind of totem pole of privilege. And so you would think that eventually people would understand how to not turn into the exact thing they're fighting. But historically, of course, that's the lesson. Like the, 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 the spunky rebels always turn into like, they always turn into the man after they get done rebelling. There's a bloody coup and whoever, you know, takes over always becomes the next totalitarian ruler. Like that's, that's how it works, right? You don't take over because again, it's like you think, well, if I was in power, I wouldn't act like that. But you don't know because you don't have power. And if you did, you wouldn't be the same person you are. It's like that thing you were talking about earlier. If I was a woman, I'd dress like this. Well, you wouldn't be the same person. And it's like as soon as they get power, boom, that's it. And for all of those who were ever wondering, like, what would happen if women had all the power? Well, you know, we kind of know now. They're just as bad as men. It's not about gender. It's about power. It's about who has power. And whoever has power sucks. That's the way it goes. Like whoever is right. in power, because it is human nature to 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 take what you want. And, you know, I mean, that is what human nature is. Right. And I don't. And to justify everything you see, as you were saying, like you see it through your own filter. And so there, when with the five different interpretive possibilities, you always are going to choose the one that just privileges your own worldview. Okay, but. But there are there are value systems that encourage people to put their selfishness in check, right? So it isn't like we should just automatically privilege our own point of view because we recognize people are selfish, right? I mean, there there are people like Mother Teresa out there, right? So we how do we how do we use this knowledge to remind ourselves to try to check that? Just like you're supposed to check your privilege, as the saying goes. How how can you go well? Wait a second. I'm the one with the institutional authority right. in this situation. Um, so, because that we go back to intersectionality. Um, so, I'm I'm a tenured professor with a certain degree of power over students and even more junior people on the university campus who who I might be in a position of evaluating or hiring or firing or any of those things. So, and yet. Uh, like the other um, faculty members I mentioned who wanted to have a women only gathering or club uh, that, you know, they also think of themselves as having the disadvantage of being women. So how do you do that? I mean, you, you could be a, a person of color who's also the dean or the provost. So you have a great deal of power, but you also feel you're a member of an oppressed group. So how do you ever know, well, wait, I, am I acting like an asshole dean right now who has all the power and I'm dismissing the other person I'm talking to? Or, or am I being um, subjugated because of my race or because of my gender? Uh, it's, that's the part where I think it's really hard for people to disentangle. And it, again, it goes back to well, how, how, your, your professor when you were a grad student is using the fact that she's a woman uh, and using the fact that you're a man to sort of act like she's going to be all feminist and respond to you as though you're being an asshole sexist man who's given her a hard time At, rather than wait a second this is like a struggling impoverished grad student who's putting everything he has into getting a degree here and i didn't even actually give him a very good education and didn't but even she do doesn't my know job. that of course she's never gonna know that yeah but so I mean, in that there's the case. She yeah, she uses her power to uh, control the narrative and and so forth. But um, but she can tell herself that she was defending herself against you using your gender and race power. So it's it's very frustrating because it's hard to it's hard for people who do have positions of institutional power to even admit that they have positions of institutional power. The question is like who has. Who has the power? It reminds me of this story when I was like 
when I was like in my early 20s and I was down living in Atlanta cutting grass at the Westminster schools, you know, it's like this super like elitist preppy school, like everybody that all the kids that go, they go there like it's like 20, however long, 25 years ago, it was like, it was like $12,000 a year to send your kids there from like pre-K through 12th, you know? And it basically, if you go there, they all just go on to like Stanford and wherever you're just buying your way at your kids ways into elite schools. It's like, you know, it's like Chilton on the Gilmore Girls, you know? And I, I was, I was there cutting the grass, you know, that's what I was doing there. And I remember one time, uh, I was supposed to go and stand up in the parking area because they were having some sort of like an event where like uh, teacher uh, parents were coming in to do something. And, and, and the guy goes, just stand here and don't let anybody park here in this one spot. And I went, OK. And immediately like some dude rolls up. Yeah, some guy rolls <laughs> up in like a in like a, you know, in like a Beamer or something. He rolls up a second later and I get out. and I'm like, uh, he gets out and I go, uh, sir, I'm really sorry, but um, um not really supposed to park. And he just cuts. He goes, I don't have time to talk to you. And he just walks right past me. Okay, so in this situation, I'm white, he's white. I'm male, he's male. I'm pretty sure we're probably both, you know, straight and cis and all that. Okay, so we're the same, right? Of course, we're not the same. And anybody, if you did a little quiz, everybody would understand who has the power in this situation. He does. But what if both of us go to a BLM signed coffee shop and sit down with, uh, you know, a, a trans lesbian. I mean, who should be able to speak now? You know, like suddenly I lost all my victim status all of a sudden. I don't have, you know, you know what I mean? They just keep shifting. And we've just got to get away from this crap because it's getting back to your constructive question. Well, what do we do? Because there is institutional discrimination, right? And this is like, so many people listening to me talk, they would say like, you know, oh, you, so what? You, know, you hate trans people and you think there's no such thing as institutionalized discrimination or sexism. No, I don't think any of that. I know that there are institutional things, but that doesn't mean that you can just like, just because, you know, being, you know, hating men, which is what so much of this is, you can do, make all this sophisticated ideological arguments you want. It's just hate. Or a bigotry, right? It's pro-female it's female supremacy in, in a sense, but we don't talk about it like that. I remember sitting with a, a woman, um, you know, sitting sitting in a bar and she's just looking at this couple, this sort of just very standard, straight looking like frat guy, sorority girl couple. And they just said they're just they're just kind of sitting at the bar together, kind of pawing each other, not in a gross way, just actually a very sort of just they look like they were a couple. And she's just looking at them with this hate in her eyes. And I was like, and I said, uh, what? And she just, she looks at me and she goes, God, just fucking straight people. <laughs> just my thought at that time with this person was, this is not, this is not a position. This isn't an argument. This isn't, this is not a position you're taking. This is just hate. It's just bigotry. That's what it is. And you can just dress it up all you want. You just hate men. And it's like another female friend of mine who's like 40, who, you know, just constantly everything, everything is always about toxic masculinity. And I said, well, what about toxic femininity? What about horrible things that women do? Uh, have we not all seen how much a woman can destroy the lives of her husband and her entire family because she's a terrible person? She just basically does nothing but but could manipulate and scream and control like a sociopathic narcissist or the way that women treat each, they train each other from the womb. Here's how we manipulate men with our sexuality. You know, here's how to withhold sex as a way of controlling men. You know, all these horrible, toxic things that women do. I said to her, what about that? And she says, well, that's still just part of toxic masculinity. <laughs> So yeah. no matter, I'm is just going to call that men's fault. <laughs> exactly. Is there anything a woman can do at this point that is actually her fault? Which brings us to my absolute favorite theme, which we will get into over and over and over again, which is accountability. You know, that is what is so much about. There is just, is there anything that you can do that makes you accountable as a woman? And of course, coming back to the point. Human nature is I want to do what I want to do and I want to take whatever I want and I don't want to have to pay for it and I want to, I don't want to have there be any consequences. Of course, that's human nature. You can't blame them for trying, but that's mm -hmm. not fair. That's not the way the world works. 
Do you let do you raise your children that way? No, you teach them, you know, do better. You do better. <laughs> That's I love that hashtag. Do better. That's such a condescending, again, splaining, suffer splaining, victim splaining thing. Do better. Like, here's what I think you should do. Do better. It's not do what I think you should do even. It's like do better because there's some universal definition. Because because we all agree on what we it assumes we all agree on what better is. And of course that's exactly what we don't agree on. <laughs>